Business is Business is the title of part two, Dirty Pop, a boy band scam. And this is for Lou Pearlman right after he gets sued by Backstreet Boys and NSYNC for the money that they were rightfully owed off of selling millions and millions of records and only receiving $10,000 in a check. Now, Lou Pearlman goes on to start reality TV show called Making the Band on MTV that we all knew about in his group O-Town. He takes that same blueprint and applies it with the same predatorial contractual agreements. But, hey, this is Lou Pearlman, the king of boy bands. Now, before we jump into this and we break this down, if you like this kind of content, docuseries, breakdowns, theories, then you're at the right spot. I'm ODIJ, and if you could, hit that subscribe button, turn on your notification bell, make sure you hit that like button. I'm on that road to 50,000 subscribers, and I appreciate each and every one of you. But let's go ahead and jump into it. This is Dirty Pop, a boy band scam, part two, business is business. By now, we've all heard that Lou Pearlman was such a huge businessman, and he had his blimp service. Well, it turns out these blimps, they weren't doing as good as we thought they were doing. Back in 89, these blimps, they would go up in the air, MetLife, Goodyear, McDonald's, all these blimps would do advertising, but one by one, they would fall out the air. Now, fortunately for Lou Pearlman, all of them were insured. And as you can see here, it says jewelry blimp builder to get $2.5 million. Now, people start pointing out that Lou Pearlman got all of his startup money by having these blimps, but allowing them to crash and getting the insurance money. Some businessman, Lou. Now, we start to hear that everyone had a different story with Lou. Some people heard that he was a businessman that would buy a plane and then rent it out. Some people heard that he would have different franchises, making money off of that. Well, some people, it was the blimps crash, and then from there, they're making a the boy band. Now, there is a story that Lou, they were in New York City, and every bank that they would stop by, he would go over there, take some money out, go to the next bank and put some money over there. He was basically moving the money that he was making so no one could track exactly where it was at. Now, Backstreet Boys, they get them a lawyer. NSYNC get them a lawyer also. And they're trying to get out of their original contract. Within this contract, they start to find out that Lou Pearlman, who considered himself a sixth member of Backstreet Boys of NSYNC, was actually the sixth member of the group. Meaning, whatever money they made, he made on top of the money he was making behind the scenes from the label. Now, in this interview, he's saying, you know how families are. It may look rough on the surface, but behind the scenes, we're fairly good. We're good. I have no issues with Backstreet Boys, with NSYNC. They're all like my sons. That's family. Well, that's because when you're raking in hundreds of millions of dollars and giving these boys 10000 and you're getting a $10,000 check because you're a sixth member but not doing the work, of course it's going to seem good on your side, Pearl. Now, this was fairly a big deal back in the day. We know that the girls, they love them boy bands. Well, Lou's lawyer said he was rightfully owned that six-member money. Lou, he's saying, listen, I built both of these groups. They should know that I spent a lot of money. Was it $100 million worth? Probably not. But Lou had a spending problem on his own. Now, these girls, they're out front of the, the courthouse because they got prayer circles. They want what's best for the boys that they love that are making music that are narrating their lives. But Lou Pearlman, the sixth member who isn't doing anything, he just wants his money. Now, NSYNC and Backstreet Boys eventually get out of this deal with Lou, and they go on to do their thing. Now, Lou said that they wouldn't be able to survive on their own, but we know that Justin Timberlake became one of the biggest artists of that generation. Now, he did have a deal with Backstreet Boys. Even though they were out of the contract, the deal was he was still the sixth member of the group. So as they went on and made more hits, he was still getting six member of the group money, checks, whatever you could think of. Lou was still a part of that, even though he wasn't getting the chunk of change that he was used to. Now we queue up making the band. Once making the band hit MTV, it caught the show, the network, everything by storm. We also know that it spinned off into Diddy's making the band also. But Lou Perlman was the one that originally started. And he had his new group called O-Town. Now, the difference between O-Town and Backstreet Boys and NSYNC was their training was televised. The way that these young men were treated on TV, it was harsh. We also know Diddy did the same thing. But he was following the footprint because this is what you needed for TV to garner in ratings. 
for Lou Pearlman working on his third group. And this wasn't his only group. He had about four or five other groups. And as you're going to see, it's the same story almost all the time. Old Town, MTV, everyone watching it, we all knew that Lou Pearlman was in these legal battles with Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. But you have to remember, the young men are trying to get into Old Town. They're coming up from nothing. This is an opportunity. More money is better than no money, even if you're getting cheated out the money. No one wants to be cheated. But to have an opportunity to actually make some money and get your face out there, they had to proceed with Lou. No one else was offering them a deal. But Lou, he's making it seem like everything's all right. That's because his deal with Backstreet Boys, he's still getting paid. Now, you remember Frankie. He's the one Lou took to Orlando with him. He actually graduated aviation school, and Lou took him on the road. So now he's on making the band. He's kind of like a babysitter, and he's looking out for the group, and he's talking to him, and he's starting to get some fame and some limelight because people are seeing him on TV. Now, of course, at this point, he's still Lou Pearlman's right-hand man because Lou gave him an opportunity. That's one thing about Lou. He may have skimmed money off the top, but he was always on a surface level looking like a family member, a good friend, and someone that would give you an opportunity. Another group that Lou had was called Natural. Now, I wasn't a huge fan of them. I've heard a couple of their songs because if you watched MTV back then, Lou Pearlman was going to get his artists on there. Now, Natural, they had a couple of songs, but they were also with Lou Pearlman. And they actually got close to Lou after all of this legal drama came. And they'll start to experience the same exact cycle that everyone else in the boy brand lifestyle experienced. I told you, we're going to see the same cycle over and over and over. Now, Patrick and his bandmate in Natural, their whole family was like, hey, you're signing with Lou Pearlman? Well, as I mentioned, they know that Lou can actually make a boy band and put them out there, market them like they're supposed to. But their family members and friends were saying, man, he's going through legal battles. Are you sure you want to do this? But when you come up from nothing, you have to take this opportunity. Now, one thing about Lou being a salesman, since he started making money, he started having people come and record in his studio. Dr. Dre and Eminem were in there. And now you see why Eminem used to go at Backstreet Boys and NSYNC so much. Britney Spears recorded in his studios. Now, the thing is, once these artists start to perform within his studio, he would start to claim them as, I had a hand in getting Britney Spears to blow up because he had a picture of her because she recorded at the studio. Oh, I know Dr. Dre and Eminem. I have them listen to our music all the time because they're recording in one of the studios. But Lou attached himself. So when he's going out and talking to the investors, it looks like, oh, hey, man, this guy Lou is well connected. We do need to work with him. And you can see how a young, impressionable artist would be like, let me sign with Lou because of all the talent he's around. Now, this gentleman, Patrick, part of Natural, starts to explain when they go on the tour. Now, you remember in part one, Lou was spoiling the boys, million dollar buses, limo rides. Well, he told them while they're on tour, listen, you don't have to pay any rent. Just throw your house, goods in my place, your clothes, and you guys stay here. I'll pay the rent and everything. You just go on the road. You do your tours and be successful. This is another control tactic that Lou Pearlman was putting on all of the artists. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll cover it for you. Natural was under the impression that they're making a lot of money. And it made it seem that Lou Pearlman just had money coming in nonstop, hand over fist. They didn't know as a new group that Lou Pearlman would have to recoup all of this money. But they figured, we're working hard. Let's take a private jet instead of taking a van. Let's go and eat lobster and shrimp instead of going to Taco Bell and eating McDonald's. So they were running the budget up. And of course, Lou Pearlman is behind the scenes, keeping each and every receipt. So when it's time to get paid, nope, you owe me for this. You owe me for this. You owe me for that. But they were young. They had no idea. Now we see Lou putting natural on the stage again. Everywhere they go, they're performing. Whether it's for bankers, Fortune 500 companies. Anyone that had a little bit of money in their pocket, Lou was going to have these artists performing in front of. They would get backstage tickets. They will get investor rights. They'll be able to jump in earlier on these groups. But this goes into Lou's Ponzi scheme, getting new investors to pay the old investors. Now, Lou made some money in the beginning, 
off of the blimps and the insurance money. But once all the NSYNC and Backstreet Boys, the big money stopped, these littler bands, he had to keep this Ponzi scheme going. And that's the one thing about a Ponzi. Once it gets started, it's hard to keep it going. Now, believe it or not, Lou Pearlman, who was one person that was great with PR, when Michael Jackson was going through his allegations about messing with, you know, underage, he went and talked to the Jackson family and said, listen, to get all the attention off of Mike, what we need you guys to do is get the Jackson group, the Jackson 5, back together, I'm talking all of them, and go on tour. And this is what was going on around 2001 because it would take all of the weight off of Michael Jackson and his allegations because it's a huge moment. The Jacksons are back together. So this tour where the Jacksons reuni reunited, it was all because of Lou Pearlman behind the scenes. The only problem is in New York, 9-11 happens, 2001. So when this tour kicks off, the news is overtaken by what happened to the Twin Towers. Now, Lou Pearlman, allegedly he called George W. Bush because they had to be back in Florida. And they fly natural on a private jet down to Florida on September 12th, escorted by a fighter jet. So this is showing you how much power Lou Pearlman actually had if he really called George W. Bush. But to get escorts the day after 9-11, you got to have some kind of pool. Now, with all this fame and fortune, they were always out eating. Lou Pearlman, he wasn't really watching his health. He always wanted to stay. He always wanted to eat more than what he needed to eat. Now, this ends up becoming a problem to him later on in life, but they're just showcasing it now how Lou was spending money. And that's why they thought it was an unlimited bankroll when we were able to go out to all these fancy restaurants and eat whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted. With those health issues, Lou ended up having to be out of commission for a while, and he gets this nurse named Tammy. Now, she was taking care of him for a couple of weeks, but then she eventually tells Lou, you no longer need a nurse. You're okay. We nursed you back to health. But after a week or two of her stopping working for Lou, he calls her, and he's asking her, what is she doing? And from there, she comes back on. But unbeknownst to her, Lou introduces her to people as his girlfriend. Now, they say they'd never seen Lou with a girl or with a man. He was always working, but he uses Tammy as his girlfriend. And she says she'll never speak negative about Lou. Now, all allegations are allegations. And even Mandy and other members of different boy bands all said they didn't see any suspicious behavior from Lou. It was some stuff that was a little weird. But no one's ever wondered, was he, you know, gay? Was he heterosexual? No one ever looked at him like that. They were just like, Lou's working. That's all we know Lou for. But no one said that they've seen any weird stuff with him messing with underage people or anything like that. So no one had anything negative to say to Lou about his personal life. Now, his business side, yes, everyone was throwing all kinds of slander at him for that. But we know he was crooked behind the scenes. Now, if you remember in part one, all of the business investors that were coming to talk to Lou, they had to deal with the mob. Now, Lou is a businessman, and he's always looking for new startups. He had a steakhouse called Pearl. We know about the TCBY, the yogurt shop. He had the blimps. He was renting planes out to different people. So Lou, he had business, and everyone wondered where the money was coming from. But, I mean, we find out that it's just new investors. Well, then things investors, new investors. Lou was always looking for the next big idea. So he ended up buying a plaza and he put Frankie in charge of it. Frankie went from aviation and being Lou Pearlman's right hand man to running this whole plaza. Now he was going to have different kind of shops here, memorabilia, restaurants, little bars. You might see members of Backstreet Boys in sync there, Old Town. So he was just trying to expand the money that he was making and, you know, put his name out there more. Now, was this plaza a success? No, it was definitely a failure. But it was Lou Pearlman coming up with ideas on how he could either launder some money or make some more money. Now, in Lou's book, he says, if you invest into my business and my successes, then I'll invest into your business and your success. Now, did Lou really invest into other people as much as he wanted investors to invest in him? No, but 
if you see that Lou Pearlman, he just bought a plaza. He just got another boy band that sold 500,000 records. They just went on the road. You're like, well, let me continue to invest into what Lou has. And then maybe in the back end, he'll invest into what I have. But Lou Pearlman was self first. Now, the truth starts to come out and they're starting to expose what's really going on with Lou. We know he's running around acting wild. But you remember that record group that he signed to, BMG, over in Germany with the Nazi pilot? Well, it turns out in order to get Backstreet Boys signed to them, he had to give up a lot of real estate just for them to get signed. And the bad deal that he had in sync and Backstreet Boys and all of his other bands in, BMG had him in that same kind of contract. So this is why he needed all these investors because he had to pay off the millions and millions that he owed to BMG just for them to give him a record deal. Now Lou's starting to lose money and he's losing money quickly. And he has a thing called AIG where basically you invest some money and your return on investment, five, 10, 15% sometimes. And one thing you need to know is if it sounds too good to be true, it is. So now we get introduced to Danielle Brooks. She's the Florida Office of Financial Regulation. And Lou Pearlman ends up calling her one time because she's having an inquiry about how is he getting these returns for people. And Lou says, I don't think you know who I am. I'm pretty much a big deal. And Danielle laughs and says, I know exactly who you are because she's about to do a little bit of digging and uncover everything that Lou's been doing behind the scenes. Now, the lawyer that represented Lou against Backstreet Boys and NSYNC that helped him win $64 million is Cheney Manson. Now, the thing is, he was speaking highly of Lou, just like anyone else that knew it. But he got firsthand experience. Once that $64 million came in, Lou was supposed to give him $16 million out of 64. Now, the reason Cheney ends up turning on him is the same reason any of us would. He never received that $16 million he was supposed to get for winning those cases. So now Cheney, he's against Lou Pearlman also, who knows everything that was going on behind the scenes when it came to Backstreet and NSYNC. Now that Cheney is suing Lou, he knows how to work the courts. So what do they do? They pull an audit of how much Lou has actually worked to try to get this $16 million. And in this case, it says, as of blank, the Bank of America Investment Services, Inc., BAI, maintains an account for Lou Perlman. The account contains a net worth of $12,822 in cash and assets. Now, remember, he won that $64 million, so we know there's some millions, and he owes $16 million to his old lawyer. Well, Lou... We heard about him going to the banks and moving money around. He says he only has $12,000. But we were under the understanding that Lou was worth millions. When Lou first met Frankie, he was young, impressionable. But he's been around everything. So he knows all the inner workings. And one night, they go to Pearl Steakhouse. But when he gets in here, they said he's acting insubordinate. He's never really talked back to Lou. But he's talking to the boy members in natural and saying, y'all don't get it. You really don't get it. And they say that he starts rambling. And if there's anyone that would know how to sink this Lou Pearlman ship, it would be Frank. But he's stressed out because he's starting to realize that the money ain't there. And Lou Pearlman has been lying to even him and cutting him out of money that he was owed. So now everyone's starting to turn on Lou. Once all of these allegations and these new court cases are coming out where he owes money. Well, after all of this, everyone started to see the shift in how Frankie was dressed. Usually it's in suits, but he would show up in just a t-shirt and some shorts. Well, R.I.P. to Frankie ends up taking his own life. Now, Lou ends up calling Tammy, his nurse slash fake girlfriend, and telling him, Hey, Frankie's uh, he's gone. And then just hangs up the phone like it was nothing. Lou Pearlman and everything he did to Lou, he helped raise Lou. He just turned his back on everybody and Frankie ended up unaliving himself. It was too much. Well, three months after Frankie unalived himself, the feds, they did a sweep. And now they're investigating Lou Pearlman. They went in everywhere. All of the mansions, all of the businesses. 
they went in there and they're about to get to the bottom of what Lou had going on. All right, there you go. Part two, a dirty pop, a boy band scam. Let me know what you think about Lou Pearlman. Would you take an opportunity with Lou and sign to him to potentially be in one of the biggest boy band groups ever? Or if you've seen that Backstreet and Instinct had issues with him, you would stay far away from him. You got to remember, this is the early 2000s, so you don't have the information that you do have now. Let me know what you think. I'm ODIJ. Make sure you tune in tomorrow for part three. We're on that road to 50,000 subscribers. So if you like this kind of content, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. I'm out. Jimmy on a beat, boy.